Welcome back to the Moldex 3D Advanced Tips and Tricks. My name is Alex Baker, and today we're going to be going over the result interpretation for cooling. In this video, we're going to talk about the six questions that we need to ask ourselves for the level three analysis or a cooling analysis after the filling and packing stages. We're going to talk about reducing our cycle time through simulation results, and finally, determining the effectiveness of our cooling system in general. The first question we're going to be looking at is is the cycle time too long? Uh, and this is probably the most important question that you want to ask yourself, especially when you're looking at uh, reducing your cycle time, increasing your productivity. You have the, the largest amount of time that you can save is in the cooling stage. So because the cooling time is the longest and because uh, the amount of time that you're cooling is interpreted based on uh, the, the temperature of the, of the part, the amount of cycle time that you can save in the cooling stage is much more than something like the filling stage or the packing stage or even the mold open stage. So is the cycle time too long? Uh, unfortunately, the question is most of the time, yes, but you know we need to really figure out why the cycle time might be longer than we need. So the result we're going to look at here is time to reach ejection temperature. And the time to reach ejection temperature, the name here is extremely important. The ejection temperature specifically is about 20, or 20 to 30 degrees below the freeze temperature of the material. So although the material is still frozen, we're actually able to still, and it's still soft enough where if we were to put an ejector pin right up against it, it would, uh, the ejector pin has a chance to just uh, push through the part. So we wanna make sure that we're cooling down our part quite a bit past the freeze temperature to ensure that the part is nice and solidified. And that's uh, what we call the ejection temperature. And you can actually specify this ejection temperature in the process, but by default in every material, have a an ejection temperature associated with it that will be somewhere between 20 and 30 degrees below the freeze temperature. So you can specify the ejection temperature right here. The freeze temperature for this material, as we saw in the previous uh, section when we were going through the packing results and we looked at the molten core, we saw that the freeze temperature for this material was 150 degrees. All right. So with that in mind, what we're looking at here is the amount of time it takes from the end of packing to reach the ejection temperature for every element in our model here. So every element of our, of our part is going to take a different amount of time to get down to this 120 degrees or this ejection temperature. So we need to identify how long it's going to take for our entire part to reach that temperature. And now what I see a lot of users doing is they just take this maximum value and say that, okay, well, this is the, this is the longest amount of time that it takes for my part to cool down. Uh, and that's, that's unfortunately not true. And the reason for that is typically because the hottest region of your part or the uh, yeah, I guess the hottest region of your part is always going to be in some thick feature. So either in your, um, in these bosses here, for example, or um, some of these features on the bottom of our part, or even in our gate itself, you know, sometimes these, these regions of our part are going to take a lot longer to cool down to the ejection temperature than the majority of our part. So we need to really identify uh, using our result interpretation skills, how much time is actually required in our cycle to cool down this part, rather than just looking at this maximum value and saying, okay, this should be our cooling time. Obviously, 60 seconds for cooling on this part. This part is only about two, maybe like a foot and a half to two feet long. Um, that would be ridiculous. A, a whole minute for cooling is way too long for a part like this. But how long you need to cool is all relative based on what actually happened in the filling and packing. You know, if I had a lot of shear heating, that means my temperature is really high and it might take a really long time in order to actually get that material down to the ejection temperature. So it's all relative based on your process. It's relative based on your material and it's relevant based on the thickness variation throughout your part. So to interpret this a little bit closer instead of just looking at what's happening uh, on the surface result or just looking at the scale here let's use a tool that we use i guess pretty commonly throughout this or pretty repetitively throughout this process we're going to use the iso surface function 
Right, remember that ISO service function breaks our result down to one single value. And first of all, I'm going to go and find how much time it takes to get all of the elements in my part to cool down to the ejection temperature. To do that, I'm simply just going to move my slider. And I'm going to move my slider pretty much until I, re until I get all of the elements in my part to disappear. So at that moment when all of, the, all of the elements in my part disappear, that means that all of my part, the entirety of my part, is now down to the ejection temperature. However, we can see that, uh, well, there's a little bit of material left in our gate, meaning that the gate's going to take the longest to cool down, which kind of makes sense. But in this case, you know, looking at the, at the scale, we started at 60 seconds and now we're down to 45, which being a 25% decrease is not insignificant, but 45 seconds is still a really long time. So we need to evaluate a very important trade-off in the cooling stage. The trade-off would be how much of my part do I want to cool down or how, like what is the quality of my part I want coming out of the mold versus how productive do I want my mold to be? How, how short of a cycle time am I or how much time am I willing to take off of my cooling so that I can make more parts? So it's always a productivity versus part quality sort of trade-off here. Now, if I cool down my part for 45 seconds in this case, or whatever, 43 seconds, as my ISO surface dictates here, if I cool down my part for that amount of time, then yes, of course, the part coming out of my mold is going to be very high quality, but I'm not going to be able to get as many parts. Whereas if I start decreasing this ISO surface, you can start to see that some of the thicker features and some of the hotter features start to show up. And the interpretation is all about how much am I, or am I actually willing to keep these features hot after I eject the part? So if, even though these features are a little bit hotter than the ejection temperature, am I okay with ejecting my part when these are a little bit hotter so that I can save on my production time? And in most cases, that the answer to that question is is yes, because you're always going to favor a, a, a higher productivity um, as long as you can maintain a lot of the, the feature tolerances in your part. And I'll say most of the time, as long as it's just small features like this, then you're, then you're okay. Once you start, if I decrease this even a little bit further, once you start getting some of these major features on your part to show up, this is where you really want to stop decreasing your your cycle time because if I if I have this wall being hotter than my ejection temperature coming out of my mold and maybe if I have an ejector pin that's going into the surface so that I can pop it out of the mold um, you know I might I might actually deform this surface and get bad quality parts coming out so I want to make sure that all of the major features of my part are cooled down to the ejection temperature leaving behind some of the uh, some of the thicker features, some of the features that are going to take longer to cool down. So in this case, I can actually decrease from a cooling time of, what was it, 43 seconds or something like that. Yeah, about 43 seconds to 16 seconds, as we just saw, or even lower than that, um, maybe even closer to 15 seconds. I can actually shave off a lot of time just by being willing to have these thicker features maintain a little bit hotter temperature uh, after the part is ejected. So it's all an interpretation-based uh, result, but it is very important to kind of evaluate that trade-off between your part quality and productivity. Okay, the second question that we're going to look at here is uh, where are the hot spots? So where are the hot spots in my mold and uh, you know where are the hot spots in my part? Where is the temperature the highest? And what is the temperature gradient across my part and also my mold? So being that we use 3D elements in Mold X3D for pretty much everything, it means that we not only have the ability to look at temperature in the part, but we can also look at the temperature of the other components of our design, things like inserts, even out to the mold base itself. So I'm going to go to my cooling temperature result. And staying in the isosurface, I'm actually just going to use the isosurface again for the temperature. 
I can use the slider to really figure out where the hotspots of my part are going to be. We should already know where these hotspots are if we went through the previous result because those are going to be the locations that take the longest to cool down. Um, so this should be pretty obvious to you. But what we're more interested in when it comes to hotspots is not always what's happening in the part, but what's happening in the mold. All right, <clears throat> so let's take a part like this. So I may have a hotspot in the ring around the bottom here, but I, I really want to evaluate how my cooling system is going to impact my part. What's happening in the center is not really, is, is going to be really difficult to um, change with a cooling system adjustment. Uh, I see a lot of users look at sink and they look at voids and they look at these sorts of surface defects and they try to cool down the part surface right at that region and they can't get rid of those they can't get rid of those features. And the reason for that is because the cooling system really only impacts the outer shell of your part. There's actually two main temperature zones when it comes to the, uh, when it comes to the thickness of your part, when it comes to what you can actually change. There's the core temperature, which is impacted a lot by what happens in the filling stage. And then there's the skin temperature, which is impacted a lot by the heat transfer from your part out to your mold base. So the the cooling distribution that you have or the, the cooling channel system that you apply to your mold is going to impact a lot what a lot of what happens on the outside of your part, not necessarily what happens on the inside of your part. So that's what we want to identify here is where the hot spots are located in the mold base itself so that we can improve where our cooling system is insufficient. All right, so looking back at our part here, um, using the temperature isosurface, I'm going to not only turn on my part, but I'm also going to turn on my mold base as well. So I'm going to go over to my model tree. I'm going to turn on my mold base. All right, and we can see that the mold base is kind of transparent right now. And the reason for that is because all of the elements in the mold base are cooler than what's happening in the hot spots of the part. And that should make sense because the the plastic temperature is always going to be hotter. Uh, I, uh, I shouldn't say always, but <laughs> the plastic temperature is very likely going to be hotter than the, the mold temperature. So in this case, we really want to reduce our isosurface slider so that we can see start to see some of the elements in the mold itself. So as I start to reduce this, you can actually start to see some of those mold-based elements show up on the surface of the part. And we really want to just stop this isosurface slider reduction once we start to see some of the elements show up, because this is going to indicate to us where the hottest regions are in our mold base. Now, what this indicates to me is that the heat was trapped in this region and it's not being extracted by our cooling channel system. So what this tells me is how I can improve my cooling system to get this heat out of this region and so that I can reduce the amount of warpage that I'm observing in the final part. Obviously, we haven't looked at warpage yet, and if you're looking at this result, you probably shouldn't have looked at warpage yet. You should use this result to, to diagnose, or I shouldn't say diagnose, to kind of get a premonition of what's going to occur in your warpage step. We're going to look at an effect in a little bit. It's called the... Um, the PVT relationship, and the PVT relationship will really dictate how the part is going to warp based on the temperature and pressure variance and other, you know, all the other phenomenon, things like, um, you know, viscosity variance and velocity variance through the part, all these different, uh, all these different characteristics are all going to impact what we call this PVT relationship, and the PVT relationship will dictate how the part is going to shrink and how it's going to warp. So if I flip over my part to the opposite side, you can also see some hot spots in the mold down here and see some, some regions starting to show up. I can continually reduce my slider here to get an idea of where those hot spots actually are from a broader, from a broader standpoint. Most of the time, these hotspots will occur whenever I have a 90 degree wall angle. So if I have, um, I'll just increase this a little bit to show. So in here, 
We can see how the wall angle is pretty much 90 degrees. It's going to be very difficult to extract the heat from there just because heat will always tend to stay in those types of crevices. And also something like this where I have a channel, the, unless I have a cooling channel running all the way along this feature, there's no way that I'm going to be able to extract the heat. There's no way to force the heat to prefer to go to the cooling channels rather than the part geometry in that location. All right, so identifying where the hot spots are in the mold base is extremely important to us as it allows us to get a premonition of what our warpage is going to look like. But more importantly, it's going to allow us to figure out how we can improve our cooling system to make the temperature distribution through the mold base more uniform. And uh, that actually leads us into the next question, which is, is the part service temperature uniform? So obviously we want the mold temperature to be uniform. And the reason for that is because the mold temperature uniformity is going to impact the part surface temperature uniformity. And the part surface temperature uniformity is going to spread throughout the entire skin layer of the, of the, of the molded part. And it's gonna impact how the part warps. If we have a uniform surface temperature, then we'll have a uniform shrinkage. And if we have a uniform shrinkage, that's going to lead to a reduction in the, the amount of warpage we, we observe in the final part. So that's what we're going to be focusing on here is just what's happening on the surface level of the part. And I can, I can get out of my isosurface result. I'm going to hide my mold base so that that doesn't show up anymore. And again, I'm just looking at what's happening on the skin of my part, not necessarily breaking this open um, with a slice or anything like that. I'm just looking at the color distribution on on the shell here. All right, we can see that the temperature distribution or the color distribution rather is kind of like a, a green to a blue, uh, which is really in the bottom side of our scale. And I'm gonna reduce my scale so it gives us a little bit more diversity in the color that we see across the surface of our part. So again, I'm just left click dragging the maximum of my scale down. I'm gonna continually do this until I get uh, a pretty good distribution of color. Usually I'll, I'll take so that a, a major surface of my part turns like a, an orange or a red color. All right, so we can see a very obvious correlation between where the surface temperature is hot and where the mold temperature uh, was highest when we were looking at the isosurface earlier. When we were looking at the hot spots, you can see that there's a correlation. I'll flip to the bottom side. You can see that there's a very obvious correlation of where that temperature was concentrated in the mold base that's also going to impact the surface temperature variance as well. Wherever we see a very high variance in surface temperature, you can expect to see a very high amount of warpage in that, in that region, as long as it's free to move. So something like this, for example, is constrained by a lot of different surfaces. I wouldn't necessarily expect this region itself to warp, um, but it may impact the warpage around this region. So that, that might be something that I could expect. Whereas something down here, I have this entire wall that's free to move. So I would expect this uh, temperature variance, this high temperature region here to impact what actually occurs with this wall. Um, so we'll just keep that in mind when we're going into the warpage results, because that may be something we could observe. All right, so surface temperature uniformity, again, is going to allow us to evaluate the impact of the hot spots in the mold on the surface temperature of the part. You can see in this case, this, this side over here is a lot more intense of a temperature variation than this side over here. We have maybe a 20 degree difference on this side, whereas on this side, it's more like 30 degrees. And that's going to lead into the next question here which is gonna be dealing with the difference between the top and bottom sides of our mold. We call it the mold temperature difference. Not much creativity going into that name, but the mold temperature difference tells us the difference between the core and cavity side of our mold. And we really want that temperature to be as close as possible to guarantee that our part is going to shrink uniformly. If the temperature is higher on one side than it is on the other, then we'll actually start to see uh, that PVT effect that I was mentioning earlier start to take hold. All right, so the mold temperature difference, if I go over into my results here, mold temperature difference is actually gonna be the second from the bottom in our cooling results here. So going to the mold temperature difference, 
Now, most of the time, the scale is kind of skewed because some of the hotter regions, uh, some of the hot spots here are always going to cause this scale to be a little bit higher than necessary. So what I'm going to do is just kind of take this scale down uh, to a more reasonable range. I'm going to take it down to pretty much until one of the major regions of our part starts to uh, become red or a dark orange. All right, so this result, you can actually see that the result never goes negative, and the reason for that is because we're taking the absolute value of the difference between the top side of our part and the bottom side of our part. So this is actually a shell result. You cannot slice this. You can't do an isosurface or anything like that. It's literally just taking the temperature on the, on the top surface and the temperature on the bottom surface and subtracting those and then taking the absolute value so the value is always positive. And what we want to see is what regions of our part are greater, have a greater temperature difference than 10 degrees Celsius. So in our scale over here, we can see that this red region is about 22, 23 degrees difference between the bottom side and the top side of our part. Now, based on our temperature distribution that we saw earlier, we know that the bottom side is much hotter than the top side because that's where the hot spot was in our mold. So we can see that temperature difference show up kind of, you can see the color distribution is the same on the top and bottom because it's just, uh, it's just displaying the same results on both sides. But it tells me that there's a very high amount of temperature difference in this region. And that is ultimately going to take hold of the PVT relationship that we're gonna be showing in just a moment here. Now, another thing I can do with this result is I can actually just change the scale, the maximum on the scale, I can change that to be 10. And we actually get a really cool display. So if I just change the maximum here to be 10, this very clearly shows me what regions of my part are outside of the tolerance. Whenever an element of the part goes outside of the tolerance of our result, um, of our result scale, it will become colorless. So any colorless region here indicates that that, that feature, that region is outside of the 10 degrees Celsius tolerance range. So this is a very good visual indicator. I usually put this in reports so that I can communicate where the cooling needs to be improved. I'll put this in tandem with my temperature result to uh, really explain where I have a, a locally high temperature and what that's actually doing to the temperature difference on the core and cavity sides of my part. All right, so this result is uh, extremely valuable visually um, because it's it's extremely easy to communicate uh, where you need to improve your cooling system based on this result. So essentially we've built up a story for ourselves looking at the hot spots in the mold and then taking those hot spots in the mold to evaluate the temperature distribution on the surface of our part and then using that surface temperature distribution to see what the impact is on the difference between the core and the cavity side. Um, which will allow us to impact or allow us to dictate what's happening as far as the PVT relationship is concerned. All right, so I've been mentioning this PVT relationship, and we really want to, you know, what is the PVT relationship? So let's say I'm starting with a nice flat plaque like this. I'm just looking at it at the side. Um, so this is the top surface of the plaque. This is the bottom surface of the plaque. And let's say we have one of the surfaces is hotter than the other. This isn't necessarily saying that this surface is cold. Uh, maybe it's like, uh, let's say that's right, the tolerance of our mold temperature difference. Let's say that this side is 10 degrees colder than this side is. I'll give you guys a few seconds. Which way do you think that this part is going to warp? Is it gonna go upwards or is it gonna go downwards? All right, to evaluate this, we're gonna look at um, what I mentioned earlier, which is the PVT relationship. So the PVT relationship essentially describes the impact of the temperature and the pressure, the temperature being on the x-axis and the pressure being on the, just kind of the different um, curves here. We're gonna evaluate those different uh, phenomena on the specific volume of our part, or rather, the change in specific volume or the volumetric shrinkage of our part as the cycle progresses. Now I'm going to, because I'm just looking at a temperature difference here, I'm gonna highlight just the x-axis. I'm gonna isolate the, um, 
I'm not going to look really at this pressure effect, but the pressure effect does in, in fact um, impact our specific volume change as well. Uh, we're just going to be looking at the temperature effect here. So when we're looking at this curve and we see that the surface temperature is different between the, the opposite sides, those initial temperatures correlate to different starting locations on the x-axis. If I draw a line from each of those temperatures up to the PV, where the PVT curve is, I'm just going to use the zero pressure mark just uh, as an example. All right, so I get two data points on those curves, and I can draw those over to the y-axis to get an initial volume. So I, I call them hot and cold here. Remember, these are only about 10 degrees Celsius apart from one another. Ultimately, we want to get these. We're, we're going to have to get these two temperatures to be equal. We're going to have to cool these down all the way to the ejection temperature, which is something that we just looked at. So we looked at the ejection temperature a little while ago. We're going to have to get these down to some temperature, which is going to correlate to some final volume. The distance that each of these has to travel is going to dictate the volumetric shrinkage that the material is going to experience. So for example, the colder material will start at a lower volume, but has to go to the same final volume as the hotter material. So the hotter material has to travel further on this y-axis, meaning that the change in volume is a little bit higher. Being that the volume change is higher for the hotter material and lower for the colder material, it actually means that the hotter material is shrinking more than the colder material is. And if that's the case, the hotter material is going to pull more on the top side than the colder material is on the bottom side. And we end up getting this sort of smiley face or this sort of upward warpage. And that's the, that's the relationship that you really want to have in the back of your head when you're looking at all of these temperature results, when you're looking at the filling temperature, when you're looking at the molten core in the packing stage, when you're looking at um, the, the temperature variance, the mold temperature difference in the cooling stage, all of these impact what actually ends up happening uh, as far as the warpage of the part with this PVT relationship. And you can also take this same effect into, or you can actually just um, correlate the same effect for the pressure as well. If I'm looking at the packing stage, for example, we are looking at how well that pressure was able to distribute throughout the part. Um, different pressures are going to correlate to different starting points on this y-axis. And um, that will do, it, that'll essentially act the same way as far as uh, the PVT relationship is concerned. So um, you can kind of do that correlation on your own. You can actually go into our material wizard, pull any material and, and see how that works. But this PVT relationship is one of the primary concerns that we have when it comes to the design of our mold and when it comes to uh, how we're filling out the part and how we're actually visualizing what's going on as far as the results are concerned. The PVT is really one of the driving forces of this entire result interpretation. All right, that being said, we're gonna move on to the last two questions of our cooling stage. First of all, is the temperature difference of the coolant inlet and outlet larger than three degrees Celsius? Um, this is actually one of, the, one of the more quantitative tools. Most of the results that we've looked at were more qualitative where we're looking at temperature distribution and we're looking at um, pressure distribution and all these sorts of things. But this, this result is actually more quantitative in the fact that we're just looking at the absolute, or ju we're just looking at the values. Uh, we're not necessarily looking at any sort of distribution. So what I'm going to do is go to a result that's called the uh, coolant temperature. The coolant temperature will tell me at the end of our cooling cycle, what was the, the temperature of the water at different regions or at different lengths along this cooling channel. Now I'm going to ignore the temperature gradient across the surface. And the reason for that is simply because where the, where the most heat transfer is occurring, of course, that's going to mean that the surface temperature of our cooling channel, I shouldn't say the surface temperature of our cooling channel, but the water temperature at the surface of our cooling channel or at the surface of the mold is uh, very hot. But if I were to slice this open and look at the temperature distribution through the thickness, we would see that there's, um, you know, this high temperature doesn't really go that far into the cooling channel. The major or the average temperature is always going to be pretty consistent. Uh, and it's going to consistently increase based on the volumetric change of the temperature. Ultimately, what we're looking for with this result 
is how much my, my coolant temperature changes from my inlet to my outlet from an average kind of view. So we're not necessarily looking at the individual regions of my part. I don't really care too much about uh, what happens throughout the cooling channel, uh, especially along the surface. I'm more of just interested in uh, what was the inlet temperature, what was the outlet temperature, and how different those are from one another. All right, so to evaluate this, I'm actually just going to change my scale. Um, you could actually do this through the ISO surface as well if you wanted to. Since we use the solid mesh elements, that's definitely possible. Um, but the scale is usually a little bit easier. I'm just going to take down my maximum. Obviously, both the minimum and maximum are kind or I'm sorry, both the inlet and outlet are at a kind of a blue color. So I'm going to reduce my scale so that I can see the difference a little bit better. I'm going to reduce this pretty much until the outlet becomes a red color. Once I get that, I can simply just take the maximum, which is the red here, minus the minimum, which should be our input cooling temperature. And that tells me what my temperature difference was. Now I want those temperatures to be within three degrees Celsius of one another, because if the temperature cha changes too much over the cooling channel, then I can actually induce a PVT change over the surface of my part just by uh, the amount of heat that's extracted by the cooling channel. So it's kind of a two-way interaction that occurs where the melt, where the part heats up the cooling channel. Obviously, the, the water is meant to be a source or a sink for the heat transfer to go. Um, but that heat transfer or the, the amount of heat that's extracted by the cooling channel can actually induce a temperature variance across the surface of the part as well. Uh, so the reduction in cooling efficiency can actually impact what's happening across the surface, and that can actually impact a, or that can actually apply some sort of uh, PVT change. So to avoid this sort of phenomenon, we like to just keep the cooling channel difference or the cooling channel temperature difference below three degrees. And you'll usually find that that's quite easy. Um, the only time that we ever really run into a problem with this uh, question is when uh, you have a really long series channel. So if I had like a really flat, like a flat plaque and I had a cooling channel going all the way across the surface of that, you could get a very large amount of heat transfer and that could heat up the cooling channel quite a bit. Um, also, if you run your cooling channel flow is really low, then uh, you can actually end up getting that sort of heat up. And if your water heats up too much, again, you'll imply some sort of temperature variance across the surface. All right, so uh, looking at all these cooling channels here, we have a about a 0.64 temperature difference here, uh, about the same here, maybe a little bit less here, and yeah, maybe even a little bit less there, and definitely less here. You can see that the temperature distribution is quite quite uh, colorful still there. We want it to be pretty much red. All right, so that's it's a pretty easy result to kind of just go through and evaluate, you know, what's the temperature difference. You could also simply just set this to, um, you know, if I start my cooling channel temperature at uh, 70 in this case, I can just set this up to 73, kind of like, like what we did in the mold temperature difference. And if any of my inlets turn a uh, red color or if they are, if the outlets disappear completely, then that means that we're outside of the range. So that's another way you can interpret this as well. All right, the last question in the cooling stage here is what are the cooling channel efficiencies? So how efficient are we actually cooling down our part? This is kind of the, the final result that tells us how effective our cooling channel system actually is. And it also allows us to compare the different cooling channels of our systems to one another. All right, so to evaluate this, I'm going to go to the fifth result in our cooling uh, result breakdown here. I'm going to go to the cooling efficiency. And you'll see that there is no temperature distribution, or there is no efficiency distribution here. Each channel only gets one efficiency, and that, that is the whole channel is just maintaining that same color. And we can just kind of read these off based on the scale. Um, you could also use like a probe to figure out what these uh, efficiencies are if you really want to. But um, you can just kind of get a relative idea here. We, we can see that this one's about 8. The maximum one's about 31.5. Uh, the yellow one's somewhere in like the 25 range, and then the green one is uh, maybe like 20. So looking at these compared to one another, we can actually see that the bottom side of our mold is more, 
or I, I should say the, the cooling channels on the bottom side of our part are more effective than the top side of our part. And that should be, that should be expected because these cooling channels are very close to the surface whereas these channels here are just more kind of uh, generic. So what this tells me is that maybe I have some improvements I can make, especially with this channel here. Remember in the hotspot question, we saw that there was a big hotspot over in here. Maybe I could change this cooling channel to bend downwards so that it could um, cool out or extract this heat a little bit more efficiently. Also along that same lines, I could improve this cooling channel here because we saw there was a huge hot spot right here, which is just the gap between the uh, the, the two, the inlet and the outlet here. Uh, I could actually change my cooling channel system to maybe be a little bit longer so that it, it extracts that heat a little bit better. So this just allows me to figure out what are the relative efficiencies. And I could actually add all of the efficiencies together to get my total system efficiency. Uh, and that's gonna tell me how good my system is as a whole. Uh, so rather than just looking at the relative difference between the individual cooling channels, uh, I can get an idea of what my cooling channel system is like as a whole and how it compares uh, to other cooling channel systems out there. Although kind of taking these values off the scale is kind of tricky. Um, so we actually have a more direct way to go about it and that's gonna be through the cooling log file. So I'll ask everybody to go into the result tab. We're gonna go over to the right side log We'll drop down, go to cooling. All right, and when you go into your cooling log file, you'll see all the inputs towards the top. And then as you scroll down through your cooling log file here, you'll see a bunch of cycles. See cycle one, cycle two, cycle three. Um, these cycles actually are a full molding cycle. So it would be my filling time, plus my packing time, plus my cooling time, plus my mold open time. Each of these cycles are a simulation of, of that total cycle time. So ultimately you'll see that the, each cycle will usually have the same, the same ending time. But what we're looking at here is the distribution of the temperature over the mold base and also over the part. We call this a steady state type calculation. And once one cycle is very similar to another cycle, you can almost think of it like the machine heating up at the beginning of the day. Uh, you'll, you'll run a few parts to get the machine up to temperature. And um, that's exactly what we're doing in the cooling simulation. We're just trying to arrive at some sort of steady point where each cycle is pretty much the same. And that will apply some sort of distribution to the mold base itself. However, the most important information here is right above the final cycle or the final calculation here. So I'm gonna find the final calculation table I'm gonna scroll up from the beginning of that table to what we call the total heat transfer. Total heat transfer table will tell me what are the exact efficiencies of each channel. And then it'll also tell me how much heat relatively was lost into the background. In this case, I have four channels in the background. All five of these numbers will always add up to 100%. For that reason, I could actually just take 100% minus my background, and that'll tell me my total system efficiency. That'll tell me the amount of heat that was extracted from my cooling system, uh, and also how much heat I've lost to my surroundings. So the background is literally just the amount of heat that is either retained in the mold base or is lost, to, um, lost outside of the mold base. So uh, heat that escaped out of our cooling system and went all the way to the surface of the mold. All right, so if I take 100 minus uh, this 12, I get 88%, and 88, 85% is really the, the, the mark of a good cooling system. That's what we usually strive for whenever we're doing any sort of cooling design. Uh, 75 is probably the lowest efficiency that I would accept. <laughs> uh, so if you have anything less than 75, there's definitely major improvements that, meet, that need to be made to your cooling system. Thank you for watching the Moldex 30 Advanced Tips and Tricks. Please don't forget to leave a like on the video if you enjoyed the content. If you'd like to suggest a future topic, feel free to let us know down in the comments. And finally, if you want to see more content like this in the future, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel.